Hi, I'm Ben, I'm 23 years old and a student at the University of St Andrews living in Dundee. I live with depression and anxiety and a few years ago it got so bad that I tried to take my own life. Things are a lot more positive for me now and this is the story of how I turned my life around. I grew up in Moneyfeath, just outside Dundee, and I suppose I had a pretty normal childhood. But for some reason that I didn't understand at the time, there was always a feeling of unhappiness lurking in the background. It wasn't so much that I felt down, but more I had no reason to feel the way I did, because you know it's, it's quite it's quite common to feel to feel sad about things, but usually there is some sort of cause or factor that lead you to feel that way and quite often I just felt absolutely terrible when my life from the outside looking in was very good and I had no reason to be sad. Feeling hopeless was quite a recurrent theme at the time. Um, I perceived there to be a lot of hard work to life. Um, you know, like I didn't choose to be born but all of a sudden I've got to look after myself, do chores around the house. I had all these exams. I was studying uh, social sciences, HNC, at Dundee College at the time. Um, I had to keep my girlfriend happy and whilst trying to juggle all this, I was getting constant panic attacks. Um, I felt very agoraphobic a lot. Out in Dundee, if it was quite crowded, I'd get quite nervous. and. Um, so I just seemed quite hopeless, no matter how much effort I put into things. Um, life would always be kind of unenjoyable. And I think that when I tried to take my life, um, it just sort of reached its peak. And I, I, I really saw no good future for myself. Me and my girlfriend of the time, we were staying here at my parents' house. And um, I think we'd had an argument and she, later, later, it was during the night, and then when she fell asleep, I was still awake with all these thoughts going through my head. And um, I went through to the kitchen, and <clears throat> there were a lot of cocodamol pills in the cupboard, which have codeine and paracetamol in them. And uh, they were my mum's for some nerve pain she'd had a while back, but she didn't use them anymore. And I, I took quite a lot of them. And then I went to bed, and it was a really, it was a very surreal night. I remember waking up, but quite often feeling like I was drifting in and out of consciousness. Um, it was a really weird dreamlike feeling I had. But I woke up in the morning, it clearly hadn't worked. But I spent the, the next day being sick pretty violently all day. Um, no one knew I'd done it though. Uh, I just told them I had a bug, and it wasn't until a few weeks later that they found out. It was a pretty confusing time for all of us. My parents were obviously very shocked. Um, I come across as quite happy and uh, quite lively to most people who meet me. So um, it, it came as a shock to my parents when, when I told them about it. They, they found it quite hard to believe at first. I wanted to share my experiences with others in the hope of helping people who are having similar experiences to mine. I created a blog post and for many people reading it, this was the first they knew of my problems. I was keen to hear what my family thought now looking back on those events, so I asked my mum and my sister how they had felt. I wasn't really aware of how deep your depression was and how it was affecting you. I didn't realise 
you know, quite the extent of how unhappy you were. So, yeah, didn't know. I was absolutely devastated. Um, so sad that you had felt so bad that you, you wanted to do that. I felt a little bit of guilt because had the tablets were there that, that you decided to take. Um, I was scared in case she would try it again. It was, it was horrible. Yeah, I didn't find out until I actually read your article and I was feeling so many emotions. Like, obviously I felt absolutely gutted and heartbroken and I was also like relieved that it was an unsuccessful attempt, but it really puts things into perspective. Like, one day I could have woken up and, you know, I didn't have my brother or my best pal anymore. I would have been gutting. What kind of help do you think would have been best for me? You tried the psychiatrist route, but that didn't really help you, did it? So, but initially I just wanted you to go to the doctor and see what, what they could do for you. I think for you, you needed more talking therapy as well as a mix of antidepressants. So instead of the psychiatrist, I think that maybe a counsellor would have been better for you. Someone that would just listen to what you had to say so you could just kind of get out your emotions and how you were feeling as well mm -hmm. as taking antidepressants to kind of you know, settle your mood a bit more. How do you think I've changed since starting to tackle depression? You're dealing with it really well, to the best of your ability now. You take a holistic approach because as well as taking medication, you're helping others, you're thinking about your diet, your sleeping habits, exercise, which all help. But um, I think because you're, you're trying to get it out in the public more, to make people more aware of it and to talk about it rather than be a taboo subject. I think that that's helping you deal with it as well, helping others. You're such, like you're much more of a confident person now and I can see that you're happier and I know you're not quite there yet and you, you, know, you, you do still get down, but not to the extent that you were before and it's just amazing to see how far you've come on and I'm like, I'm just so proud of you for helping other people and that, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was quite interesting talking to my mum and my sister. Um, despite the fact I live with them, it's, it's not something that we often make a habit of talking about. Um, you know, we just go about our normal lives most of the time. So it was it was good to sort of hear how it affects them as well. Um, my sister, she has her own problems with anxiety and. Uh, she sort of, it, it's good to know that we have a, an understanding with each other and we can talk to each other if we need it. Like me and my sister are a really good uh, sort of team. It's important to talk to your family about uh, when you're suffering from mental illness. Sometimes you hear a problem shares a problem halved, but sometimes you feel like a problem shares a problem multiplied. And by talking, all you're doing is just making your family sad because they can't help. But you know, it really, it really is good to talk. After speaking to my family, I was also interested to find out how my friends reacted to the news about my mental illness and the fact that I had attempted suicide. I met up with Sam and Duncan, two of my best mates from school. Obviously, depression is something I had throughout my time at school. Is this something you're completely unaware of, or was there maybe clues, or were you able to guess like maybe something was up? I think the shock is when you say that when you say someone's depressed or someone's depressed, someone's sad. But when you say Ben's got depression, that's mm. a different ballgame. Yeah. That's uh, that goes from Ben's a bit down the dumps to Ben's actually, actually got something. Right. Being told that this is depression, this is something bigger than just being down. Mm -hmm. So, what was your reaction when I went public with depression? My first, I I remember you telling me before it went into the paper. And I remember thinking, Ben's coming out about being depressed, and it's like now it's a thing where you've got to go away and keep an eye on him, and then you don't want people to know because I thought you'd want to keep it a secret. I thought it was something that you were going to overcome yourself and deal with, and then it comes out in the paper, but then it comes out in the paper, and all these people are like, I have depression too. All these people are like, Ben, can I get help? Ben, can you do this? Ben, what did you do in this case? And it's like, why would Ben keep depression to himself when he can get over it himself? or you can get over it in front of people and you can take people with them. Yeah. That was, I think that was the aim about you coming out. 
it wasn't a case of I've got depression. I want to tell people it was a case of I've got depression. But I want to make all I'm going to get better. But I want to make all these other people better too. Make some good come out of it. Yeah. After I went public with depression, did it change the way you saw me at all? I don't no. think so. I think because we got closer. Like, yeah. Because we were well, we were starting to get closer and speak more, and then we found out. But yeah. I think we still yeah. kept getting closer yeah. and yeah. catch up more. Yeah. So it really just didn't make a difference. Not really, no. Type of person I am. I'm always whether you're depressed, or don't like you. Whatever was the case, I was always going to reach out and speak to you because the type of person I am. Mm -hmm. Didn't I? Wouldn't say we got any further apart, but. It, Definitely made our friendship a little different and a little bit more like tight knitted and more bonded because it was this sort of thing where it was like you were thinking about it more. Yeah, like you were thinking about. It. How, I wonder how Ben is. So it's not just a case of I'm gonna send Ben a photo of a cat playing on a, a guitar. I'm gonna ask Ben how he is. I'm gonna see how Ben is as opposed to just messaging Ben. I think it's good that, like we can speak and do things and not speak about it. And, like yeah. Take your mind off it. Like it, does, it doesn't no, have to be. Not, the need to, either. Yeah. Don't need to every time we speak. Speak about it. We can speak about other things and do other things. So you can't glaze over it either. You no. can't just avoid it because yeah. it's a part of your life, mm. and then it becomes a part of our life as well. Mm. It becomes something that because you want to be because you bring your friends and because we're with you, we do you do it together. So, what would you say to people who maybe have depression or some other mental illness that's a secret and they're worried about how their friends would react if they found out? Your true friends aren't gonna turn you yeah. away. Yeah, they didn't. They wouldn't. They're not your true friends. And then, in which case, you'll find other new friends will come to the surface yeah. and be the proper friends that you need to get you through it. And if you go through it alone, that's no way to be. You need someone. And even okay, maybe not your friends to start with. Maybe go to a family member. But once you got that family member, your friends, your friends will pick you up. Your friends will be the ones that get you through it, because your friends at the end of the day are the people you've chosen to be with, and they've chosen to be you. So they're gonna pick you up and drag you through it. Do you think opening up made it easier for you? Um, I think what I found is I, I had an idea of <clears throat> what depression meant and how other people would view me if they were to find out. And I think after coming out, what that did for me was shows me that I was wrong and that it really wasn't that big a deal as I thought it was that essentially people don't really, you know, it, it doesn't change people's no. perception. But you coming people. out and taking the step is let other people see that if he can do it, I can do it, sort of thing. If he can come out and say it, well, you, I'm going to hold my hand up and say, I've got depression as well, but at least there's someone there that I can be like me, and speak to. You tell me stories like people messaging you and that, which I think is quite crazy yeah. to think of. Mm -hmm. People that you don't know. Yeah, it sort of, it sort of like kicks off this chain reaction, yeah. this sort of Mexican wave of people coming out with their, their own stories, which is good because then it has that effect of getting even more people. Yeah. As a student at St Andrews University, I was very keen to find out about the support on offer for students with mental health problems. I discovered there were a variety of different services available and I was really impressed at how much help students could get. One organisation called Student Minds has a large part to play, as I discovered when I spoke to Laura Bridey. Student Minds is kind of spread across several different spheres of mental health. Like, first of all, there is the main volunteer group, and what we do is we put on events and collaborate with other societies in order to raise awareness and education about mental health. So that can involve, like, collaborations with Yoga Sock, because yoga is very good for anxiety and for just calming oneself down, or we put on stuff that's far more direct, like films, documentaries and talks and things like that. On the other side, we were also um, a support services. We're student, student run, um, so everyone involved is trained to facilitate these kind, this kind of support. So we've got peer support, which is mainly for people who maybe just feel a bit lonely. They feel homesick. They're they're having difficulty communicating with their friends. What's going on with them? And peer support is just in case they don't want to talk to like a therapist or to like sort of an authority figure. It's just another student that takes them out for coffee or they go and see a film or something like that. And it's just almost like for company as well and then there's the eating disorder support group which is pretty self-explanatory it's a support group for people not just who have diagnosed eating disorders or who people who are recovering in recovery have recovered and want to
come back. It's for people who simply have a difficult relationship with food or with their bodies. It's something that can be super difficult to talk about without having, say, like a GP say, this is what you have, or a psychiatrist. But it's just sometimes a feeling within yourself saying, I'm not really happy with the relationship I have with food. Each year, Student Minds organise a Mental Health Awareness Week, consisting of a number of different events. What we do basically is we end up collaborating with a lot of societies. It's partly about raising awareness of just the society, of the group in general and the services in general, and then some of them are more geared to actually addressing mental health. And what we found this year that was really exciting, we actually had people who heard about Mental Health Awareness Week and those societies got in touch with us saying, we want to do something for you. And it's wonderful when that happens because it absolutely proves this is not something people are ashamed to talk about. It's not, there is a need there of desire to communicate and to help and I just I think that's so wonderful because it goes against everything our society essentially teaches us. One of the events planned was a seminar where current students were able to talk about their experiences of mental health. I've actually managed to get three men involved which sounds like it doesn't sound the biggest deal ever <laughs> but um, mental health is still very much the domain of the white female because yeah. women are seen as quite emotional and weak and vulnerable things that we all associate with having mental health problems which first of all not true at all mm. and men aren't almost allowed to talk about it as much and I think that I think always almost directly correlates to the highest suicide rate on young, amongst the young men because they're just not allowed to talk about that kind of thing and the fact that three men got in touch with us and said I want to talk about this just make, makes me super happy because <laughs> again once you start bringing this out into the open it makes it easier for other people to share. What future do you see for mental health awareness and support in St Andrews? I think it can only really get better from here. Um, now that people are starting almost to come out of the shadows, and it sounds a bit cliched, but this is where they've been kept when it comes to being alienated and being isolated. I think it's only going to get better from here, and more people are getting up, getting in involved, and I think that's wonderful. And the more that people get involved, the more people will be aware, and the cycle just keeps going round and round. I was happy to be one of the men involved in the seminar Laura organised, as I always find it really useful to talk publicly about my experiences. Generally nowadays we use sort of a mixture of medication and therapy to help people get better, but we're still not quite on the ball. So I thought I'd lay out my vision for the rest of the 21st century and how I'd like people to remember us when it came to mental health when they look back. So. I want to see people get help when they need help and not three or four months down the line because in that time they only get worse. <clears throat> when people do finally get help, I want to see them get comprehensive therapy rather than just be bunged off on medication because medication works sometimes but it's not always the answer. And when people do get therapy, it's just cognitive behavioural therapy, which is good but it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. And finally, I want to see mental health treated with the same respect as physical health, because quite often it's not. One of the other main support services for students at the University of St Andrews is the confidential phone-in service, Nightline. Nick Farrer told me how the team are able to help students with their problems. So uh, Nightline is at its heart, it's um, a listening service. We're open sort of late in the evenings when other services aren't quite so available. And it's very simple, we're available by phone, email or instant messaging. And the idea is if you just want something on your mind, if you want to chat about something, maybe if you want to know something and you're having like difficulty finding the information, uh, you can call us and we'd be very happy to oblige you in whatever way. We have some people phoning us about uh, perhaps more serious things, I know you're involved in mental health. Uh, we have people a lot of people talking to us about, you know, um, less serious things, you know, uh, we could have like flatmate trouble, you know, relationships, as, as well as, you know, the other things. We have some people who just want to know where the next exam is. Uh, we're always very happy to oblige. We're happy to just offer a safe space for people to just chat about what they're feeling, sort of sound their thoughts about, you know, and, and hopefully by the end of the contact, you know, um, they'll be feeling a bit better about it. So obviously there's quite a few listening services available, um, Breathing Space, Samaritans. Mm -hmm. What is it that sets Nightline apart from these services and makes it unique? Okay, so Nightline is its student run. 
and it sort of it's, it's all volunteered and manned entirely by students. You know, uh, especially if you're a student phoning in, that you'll be speaking to someone who has some awareness and some experience and a lot of empathy, you know, um, about what it is you want to talk about, uh, about what you're feeling. Uh, this is, of course, not to disparage any of the other services. Like all of the listening services, Nightline operates on a few principles of, you know, um, non-directivity, confidentiality, anonymity, you know, and just uh, being empathetic in general. How do you go about selecting the volunteers who talk on the phones and what sort of training process is there for them? Okay, uh, we have a, a fairly rigorous application process. Uh, we have a period where we make ourselves known that we're uh, open for applications. We go and talk in lectures and things so people know that it's happening. Uh, from that point, people sort of write a written application. Uh, we take that down, we bring them all in, and we offer interviews to uh, like quite a lot of the people who apply. And from then on, after the interview stage, um, we, we gather up together, we decide how many you know, uh, offers we want to send out. Then afterwards comes the training for those people who are successful, and it's, it's very, very rigorous. We just had a training period pass, and I'm still exhausted from it, frankly. Uh, it's two weekends of, of nine to five, practically. Uh, we're extremely thorough. We go over all our policies, uh, the best way to handle calls. Uh, we go over where the law makes us be aware of certain things, uh, a bit of uh, uh, empathy, I suppose, awareness about certain issues. What would you say to someone who maybe wanted to use Nightline services but were nervous about phoning up? Uh, please don't be, although I entirely understand that it's difficult. We operate on five principles which are sort of designed to make your call or your contact, your IM, as comfortable as possible. Uh, we're absolutely anonymous. Um, you don't know who we are, so there's absolutely no chance of phoning us up and seeing us at a lecture the next day, for example, because you don't know who we are. Conversely, on anonymity, we don't know who you are. We don't ask for any identifying information. Um, even if, for example, you wanted to see a GP, we wouldn't ask for your name to refer you to who your GP is. We'd, um, we'd give you the options and we'd say if you're from X to Y surname, you need to see them, or if you're from A to B surname, you need to see them. Uh, we're entirely confidential. We don't talk about the content of calls, we don't take logs, we don't take records, nothing like that. Uh, nothing that you say is going to be held in record, you know. We are also empathetic, and I'm going to differentiate empathy from sympathy here, because sympathy is almost sort of, uh, I suppose if you were stuck in a hole, sympathy would be looking down, empathy would be sort of getting in with you. Uh, it's not looking down on anyone, it's just understanding like, on a very human student-to-student ba student student basis that you know, um, things can be difficult and we're cool about that. It's always good to discover creative ways of dealing with mental health problems, so I was interested to hear about a social enterprise called How It Felt, which uses puppets to help people. Well, pretty much it became a university project when I was in third year at Duncan and Jordan Stone and I had a friend of mine who we both grew up like in the 80s and 90s and we both fell in love with like Muppets, Jim Henson and Labyrinth and all that kind of stuff. And we were like, oh, uh, wouldn't it be really cool if we could do puppets sometime? And then we were like, oh yeah, maybe we could. I mean, we're in the uni, let's try it. So we ended up doing a puppet project, but we didn't really know what we wanted to do it about. Um, and then we ended up making like puppets of ourselves after we had conversations with each other about mental health because we were friends. And we were like, oh, what if we used the puppets with our conversations that we had with the sound that we recorded of these? So then we made puppets of ourselves, put them in like normal situations, like in your living room and your university and blah, 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 and made them like talk like they were having the conversations then and there. Hi everyone, nice to meet you all. My name is Deborah and this is Deborah. Uh, we run a social enterprise called How It Fell. Uh, we are based in Dundee uh, currently and we've been going around schools, uh, community centres, support groups. Um, we usually do puppet workshops with kids, but sometimes we have done it with adults as well, so we're not limited to age and we mostly focus on mental health. I mean, mental health is something I'm quite passionate about and it's something that I want to raise more awareness of and it just seems to be puppets as a good medium for that. <laughs> I was lucky enough to take part in one of Deborah's workshops and it was great to see how relaxed people were with the puppets and the positive effect that they had on everyone in the group. Okay, well should we have a go? Who wants to talk to who? It gives people a voice and people can't really judge a puppet. Like you can say whatever you want with them and I think it like considering mental health can sometimes be quite 
sad to talk about or quite, you know, expressive. Some people find that really difficult, but maybe through a puppet, because you're using it as a tool, you can communicate better with what you want to say. Um, so yeah, it seems to be through that they find it a lot easier and also it's easier to watch a puppet talking about something that's necessarily not easy to hear or, you know, say sometimes. Back in St Andrews, it's recognised that exam time can be one of the most stressful parts of the year. Student services have come up with an amazing way to combat this, pet therapy. So we have the relaxation station that's going to be running all week and it's an idea we came up with in student services as a way to give students a chance to come out of the library and away from revision and take a wee break and have a bit of fun through the week. So all sorts of things going on. We have a mini zoo going on and um, all sorts of creatures, some furry and some not so furry and just a chance for the students to come and have a cuddle and get up close and personal with some different things and have a bit of a giggle and there's a lot of that going on in there which is great. One of my main passions in life is politics and I'm proud to be a member of the Liberal Democrats. I was delighted to get the chance to speak to the leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, Willie Rennie about his views on mental health. Why are the Liberal Democrats placing such importance on supporting mental health sufferers? I mean, Liberal Democrats have always argued that those who feel disadvantaged, wherever they are in society, deserve a helping hand. You know, it's not, we don't want to just do things for people, we want to give them the opportunities to thrive themselves. And mental health has been one of those conditions that nobody really talked about, they were a wee bit embarrassed to say perhaps they had a relative who had a problem or even themselves had a problem. And by just blowing it apart, by breaking that taboo, then we gave people opportunities, just even just to talk about it. In what way can political parties influence the support available for people with mental health problems? Well, we can have a big impact in terms of how public services run, because obviously through the legislature, through the parliament, we can set the laws, through budgets, we can decide how much money is going to be spent on a particular area. And then through scrutiny and accountability, we can hold ministers, but also public service managers and bosses to account for the services that they're running. So by shining a spotlight on a particular area, we can make a big, big difference. So the audit uh, committee in the parliament, it's got an important role to play, but so has the First Minister's questions, and I've raised you know, mental health issues at First Minister's questions before. Um, in politics, you know, everybody can ever kind of agree to things. You know, we, you know, you won't find many politicians who say that mental health shouldn't be treated properly, but it's the priority that political parties give it. How often do they talk about it? How much money are they going to put into it? How much time will their politicians spend talking about it proactively rather than being asked? how they're going to deal with it proactively, because that sets the mood for the decision makers in the Scottish Government, but also in public services at large. So that's why we talk about it a lot, and that's what politicians from whichever party they're from can do. The amount of time we spend on it, the greater focus there is on getting that service right, and that's why it's important to do what we're doing. Is this a problem which is increasing, or is it something which is recognised and discussed more often? I'm not sure if there's particular evidence that it's increasing, although the stresses and strains in society has added greater pressures upon individuals. You know, and sometimes it's you know, low-level stress and depression that people can have, but also there's big bang traumatic experiences that some people go through with the army, the military, um, or indeed accidents or events in their life. So it, the range is huge, and that's why we need to have a service that's reflective of the different needs that different people will have, because no one person's condition will be the same. So I'm not sure if it's increasing or not, but what you are getting is more people coming forward and expressing themselves because that taboo has been smashed. So I think there is a, probably a bit of both. I'm sure there's fluctuations in terms of the prevalence of a condition but there is no doubt that because more people are aware of it, more people are prepared to talk about it, that means that there's a greater demand on the services. But child and adolescent mental health services, the formal bit of the NHS, that is very poor. Um, we're not getting the quality service that we really need to have. 
And for instance, you know, there's no child and adolescent mental health service beds north of the River Tay. That's just not acceptable. The, the service, the, the waiting time within Tayside is poor. It's the worst in Scotland. You know, so many people have to wait well beyond the target waiting time. That's unacceptable. So there's a lot to learn from young people's services that kind of softer support, peer support. But there's also an awful lot of improvement required on the formal mental health services provided by the NHS. I met up with Willie again a few weeks later when he was interviewed by STV News and I was pleased that the report also mentioned the documentary. I just felt absolutely terrible. New money and resources could really help people like Ben Laurie. A documentary charting his struggle with depression caught the eye of Lib Dem leader Willie Rennie, who says even more should be done. We need to have a network of centres right across Scotland so every child, every adolescent can get the support that they need. Not long afterwards, I was a contributor to the Kay Adams programme, hosted by Louise White on BBC Radio Scotland. Let's hear from our guest this morning. We're joined by Ben Laurie. He is a student and a mental health activist. He's in our Dundee studio. Morning to you, Ben. Hey. Mental ill health is something that sometimes people don't want to talk about, so well done you for agreeing to come on. Let's hear your story. Um, OK, well, essentially I've suffered from depression for as long as I can remember, um, but never really sought treatment for it until I was about 16, 17. Um, and what I found when I finally went for treatment was that waiting times are very long. Um, the treatment sometimes isn't that great. There's a lot of waiting between sessions. And um, this is something that's inspired me to sort of go on and campaign for improved mental health services. Throughout my time at St Andrews, I've always been very impressed by the support on offer to students, particularly through student services. Mark Ford explained the role that this organisation plays at the university. So student services are trying to help students reach their, their full potential while they're at university. And we realise that um, coming to higher education, being a student, is a different experience for different people. Um, and we try and provide support and guidance for students who, who need it. Um, some students um, don't need any contact with student services. For some students, they need just a little bit of support and advice to get them over particular hurdles or things that they're facing. Mo most of the students who contact student services will see one of the support advising team, first of all. Um, some of the terms we use to describe them are um, common sense and compassion. Um, support advisors provide advice and guidance, and that can be absolutely anything that students can come and speak to them about. And what we're trying to do is to build um, a student body that's resilient, um, that know how to access self-help material and then provide support for those who, who need it. What's it like being in a supporting role for people with mental illness? Sometimes mental health can be viewed a, a, as a negative thing. Um, and actually, um, the World Health Organization defined mental health as helping every individual to realize their own potential, to cope with normal stresses and strains of life. And an important part of that is, is well-being and resilience too. And one of the opportunities that we have is to try and signpost students um, to material that will really help them, to be able to help them over a hump. Um, and to empower them as well, you know, in being able to take steps to look after their own mental health and, and well-being. We recognise that there are students who come to university who need extra support. And then for us, it's been able to put that into place. So for, for me personally, it's incredibly rewarding. Um, it's um, a, an exciting group of people to work with. Um, it's a different group of people, sometimes every year, from different backgrounds and different cultures, on different courses. Um, I learn a huge amount from speaking with students and interacting with students. And I think, you know, in a student age group, there's a huge potential to be able to help and support and to be able to affect change, a real lasting change sometimes in terms of mental health and general health. What more can universities be doing to support students with mental illnesses? 
So I think universities need to promote mental health and, 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 and well-being. And that, um, I think, ideally involves student engagement as well. So getting students on board with the healthy messages. Um, also health pr promotion campaigns, getting the message out to students and involving students in that. I think as much as we possibly can do to try and prevent circumstances that are detrimental to students' mental health as well. And then to provide the support through student services here, but to link in with local health care as well. So we work very closely with the, the, the local GPs, um, with the National Health Service. So trying to tie all that together so that students can access the help and support they need when they need it. And the university has a very definite role um, within the NHS, you know, as a separate organisation, but working in partnership with them. Obviously, depression and anxiety don't just affect students. So I was interested to hear from Kevin Ditcham about the work he does for NHS Scotland to help sufferers. So assist is available for anyone in the community above the age of 16. Um, so in every kind of local authority area, there's someone um, that kind of takes um, the lead in, ten, in terms of organising training under the Choose Life initiative. Um, so Choose Life is, is Scotland's um, strategy and action plan to prevent suicide. Um, so yeah, so there's people in every local authority area that someone can get in touch with to book on to train in um, and anyone over the age of 16 can take part. Normally courses are well publicised and things so it, it looks at people's attitudes and beliefs around suicide and kind of getting people to open up about their experiences and their kind of their own personal experiences with suicide and I, I suppose the attitudes and beliefs that those have shaped um, and then kind of getting people to start looking at a, what we call a pathway for assisting life um, and, and that's basically the steps that someone can take to meet the needs of someone at risk of suicide in terms of keeping them safe and then it teaches people to put a safe plan in place to make sure that that person's immediate safety is increased um, to prevent suicide. In, in Scotland we're um, double the rate of, of suicides in the rest of the UK um, and we know that the male suicide rate is, is much greater than that for females. Um, I, I don't know, I, I don't think it's ever been proven, but I, we think it's around the, the sort of macho kind of figure that men play or, or feel that they have to play, um, and therefore it's not okay to talk about feelings. So we're really trying to sort of break down those barriers and get men to talk and, and, and discuss with their peers and whoever, friends, family, colleagues, um, that it's okay to talk about mental health. And in turn, that would that would um, play a, a great role in preventing suicide. So we have seen a fall in suicide rates in Scotland, which is, can only be a good thing, but I think in local communities on the ground, the stigma and taboo around suicide still persists and there's still a lot of issues around people talking openly and honestly about suicide or just knowing that it's okay to talk about suicide and that it's not going to put the thought into someone's head if they're not if you're thinking of suicide and you know just that open and direct and honest talk about suicide is the best way to prevent it and I suppose mental health as well open and direct and honest talk about mental health in general is um, the best way to to promote good mental health and for people to to lead mentally healthy lives. As part of my campaign to raise awareness of mental health issues and to work towards improving provisions for treatment in Scotland I decided to stand for the local council elections in May 2017. Willie Rennie and a team of volunteers assisted me with door-to-door -door campaigning, which was a huge help, as with my anxiety, this was something that I find quite stressful. I'm pleased to say it was successful, and I was elected to serve on Angus Council, and I've been combining my councillor duties and my university studies ever since. So that's a look at my life over the last 18 months or so. It's amazing just how much has changed in such a short period of time. And although I still suffer from anxiety and depression, I feel that I'm in a far more positive place now than I was when I tried to take my life. It's been a bit of an eye opener for me, discussing my condition with family and friends, because I suppose when I was at my lowest point, I was focusing more on my own feelings and thoughts rather than those of those around me. So it's been interesting to find out more about their thoughts on my condition. One thing's for sure, I wouldn't have been able to make the progress I have without their love and support. I still have stressful times in my life, juggling my university course with my council duties, and with final exams not that far away, I'm well aware of the pressures that lie ahead. However, I do feel better equipped to face these challenges, especially after a recent visit to the doctor. 
In the past, my attempts at getting professional help haven't been particularly positive, but I've now been prescribed medication that's working for me, and I finally feel that I'm getting the medical support that I need. Mental health features frequently in the news headlines these days, and although we're making progress, there is still a stigma which needs to be tackled. I'm proud that through my work with the Liberal Democrats and as a councillor, I'm doing my bit to raise awareness of the issues and campaigning for increased support for sufferers of mental illness. I hope that this film plays a part in that others with mental health problems should realise that they're not alone and that lots of different types of help are out there. It's easy to feel isolated, but it's important to discuss feelings with others and seek out help before things become too overwhelming. I hope you found it interesting to hear about my experiences and that if you've been affected in the ways that I have, you have a bit more information about where to go for help. Thanks for watching.